My guest today is C.W. Goodyear, an American author born in New Orleans, Louisiana. He's recently published a biography of the 20th president of the United States, James Garfield. So, Charlie Goodyear, it's a pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you for your time. Thank you. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be on, Tyrell. So uh, you lived in Louisiana as a kid. How long did you live there, and what were the circumstances that led you to living in Australia and the UK? Oh, yeah. Well, hardly long at all. I, you know, I was born in New Orleans long, and I lived there for long enough to claim I'm from there, which is 90% of the benefit for a lot of people, um, since it's <laughs> such a well thought of place, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, no, I lived, I left uh, New Orleans when I was about five years old. And the reason was my dad got a job overseas in Australia. And uh, I think with a lot of expatriate families, it's the same story. You get yanked abroad. And uh, that first trip becomes one of many. And that's exactly what my family's experience was like. But it was very interesting because, uh, you know, my family remained in terms of our cultural identity and, you know, where we always went home for the holidays. It was always the United States. And so uh, my fascination with American history, my identification with it, it started a very long time ago. So uh, that that is something that's come up a little bit on the book tour, which is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when did you get very interested in American history? And, I, and ironically, it was when I was not in America. Um, it was mm -hmm. when I was as an American expatriate growing up abroad. So um, yeah, and, and that might give a few of the shrinks in your audience a few pieces of material to work from. <laughs> yeah, so you returned to the United States to go to Yale? Is mm -hmm. that right? Yeah, yeah. that's right. I, I came back for uh, university. And you studied global affairs or international relations there? Yes, global affairs is what they now call it at Yale. And, uh, you know, global affairs, international relations, those are the same words run through a synonym machine. Um, mm -hmm. so it was, you know, you get the idea of the curriculum, but it was a very nice, all-rounded and rigorous approach to, you know, the subject matter. So again, you see the, the duality of this thing. When I was abroad, I was really in, interested in America. When I got back to America, I retained, you know, a little bit of exposure to that international community I used to be a part of. Mm -hmm. Did you have a chance to take courses in American history, like a uh, civil war with David Blight, for example, I remember I did, years actually, ago as watching. As a matter, yeah, <laughs> as a matter on of the fact, internet, his course. <laughs> yeah, no, I did take that course, uh, and, and not only that, I it was I believe it was called the Civil War and Reconstruction with uh, Professor Blight, and that that was mm -hmm. one I took. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm not sure which year of the class you watched. I don't think it was recorded the year that I was taking that class, but. Maybe it was, I'm not sure. And then there are other historical courses that I took while at Yale. You know, what was great about, and one of the reasons, honestly, that the American education system, you know, works so well at, at the university level is the diversity of experience a lot of students are able to access. Uh, and so uh, I had a lot of exposure to historical subject matter. And it was always, always, I, I honestly, I wanted to double major. I wanted to do a double major in history and with global affairs, which was an option back then. I believe it's still an option at Yale. But I was uh, the general feedback I got is that double majoring is a good way to make sure you enjoy neither subject rather than both. <laughs> if that makes any mm -hmm. sense, you, you think it's so you get exposure to both of your interests. Instead, it makes you not enjoy either of them as much. Uh, but I, I retained that curiosity. And, uh, but it was ironically, it was through my global affairs coursework that I ended up actually getting a start in my writing career at all during my senior year. So my final year, uh, actually, as a matter of fact, it was my junior year. Uh, during my junior year, I was taking a seminar class with General Stanley McChrystal of the U.S. Army. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he enjoyed my writing and he, uh, he introduced me to a friend of his, a former aide de camp of him in, in the military. And together with that person, Chris Fussell, I, I, I worked as a co-author with, with Chris uh, during my senior year. So this is the year after I took that seminar with General McChrystal. And then I moved down to D.C. and I started writing uh, books, you know, with and for other people. And gradually uh, I gathered a, enough experience and enough of uh, a, a creative spark to 
uh, venture into this this uh, this biography of James Garfield, which was an unlikely enough subject, uh, but it ended up taking you know several years of my life, and it was a you know very uh, it, was, it was a very interesting and uh, scholastically entertaining adventure, I'd say. Hmm. It it uh, was great to to read this biography because I think James Garfield is someone largely overlooked, at least in the collective memory of American history. And uh, reading the biography, we see that he doesn't deserve this at all. I mean, he is uh, one of the great stories of American history and uh, the American dream. So, Yeah, no, he, that, that's the question that I've been asked. Uh, you know, sometimes I've described it as thousands, but that's probably a little bit of an exaggeration. I'd say more like hundreds of times since I began writing this book. And then in the time since when I've gone on the book tour, the question everybody threw at me was, why James Garfield? Because you're right, in, in, in American popular memory, you'd be hard pressed to find a president who is less widely remembered than James Garfield. And uh, when people do remember him, typically, it's because of how he died. He was the second president to be assassinated, and he was shot and then you know, died shortly thereafter uh, within his first year in office, his first year in the presidency. He actually only made it about six months uh, into that office. But when you dive deeper down, you, you, you find what I'd argue to be one of the most compelling American ascents to political power in American history that you know, the nation has ever seen. James Garfield was described even before uh, his rise to the presidency as being one of the most influential and accomplished Americans of, of all time. Rutherford Hayes dis- is said so when he, 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 as Rutherford Hayes was another one of those forgotten Gilded Age presidents. But Rutherford mm-hmm. Hayes said, the truth is no man ever started so low who accomplished so much in all of our history as James Garfield, not even Abraham Lincoln or Benjamin Franklin even. And, uh, you know, a brief look over the resume, it shows you why that is. James Garfield, last president born in a log cabin. He was born in rural Ohio, uh, raised by a single mother, never really knew his dad. His dad died when James Garfield was only about two years old. But uh, then you fast forward to his late 20s, and he is a very prominent state politician in Ohio. And then shortly thereafter, he is at that t- at, at the time uh, the youngest general in the Union Army during the Civil War. And then shortly thereafter, uh, he is then the technically the second youngest congressman in uh, the United States during the middle of the Civil War. Uh, And then he has a 17 year congressional career, which is an incredible stretch of time for that period of American history. And he is a practicing attorney arguing cases in front of the Supreme Court. He is uh, a prolific writer. Uh, he, he even founded the first federal department of education as a congressman. Uh, and, uh, he also in his free time authored an original proof of the Pythagorean theorem. And this is all before his presidency. So you have a, uh, an incredible public legacy. So, you know, tr- the, the term Renaissance man has been thrown around a lot regarding his, uh, his his accomplishments in life, and that's totally accurate. But it is interesting that for all of those accomplishments, um, because of the way that life ended, that assassination, and we might talk more about that in a little bit, uh, the result is in many people's memory, that's, that, that's all they remember him for, the death rather than the life that came before him. So just from an authorial perspective, like one of the, th- one of the motivations with this book was that I I wanted to give more credit to the life, which, you know, you could argue is what biography is all about. It's how these lives are lived. So um, it was, you know, deeply enjoyable. And I'm I'm glad you enjoyed the read as well. I'm glad that came through. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, it did. Uh, That memorable line that you mentioned a moment earlier, that he was the last president to begin his life in a log cabin. Mm -hmm. Could we... pack that a little bit. Could you explain briefly what the reserve was in Ohio and what mm. it was like around the time of Garfield's birth and uh, what brought his parents to that region? What were the circumstances from which he rose? 
uh... Sure. Yeah, the Western Reserve, it was called the Western Reserve of Ohio. Uh, and uh, ironic, or oxymoronically, I'd say, at least from a modern ear, that's actually, it's actually the northeastern portion of the state of Ohio. Uh, it was originally called the Western Reserve because originally the, that, that section of the continent was uh, part of the territory of Connecticut back, back, back in colonial times. And so from the perspective of people living in Connecticut, which, you know, for audiences that's on the northeastern uh, coast of the United States, uh, the inner uh, coastline of Lake Erie, one of the Great Lakes, the, the, the future Western Reserve, that's nothing if not the West to those colonists. And it is reserved for them. So it was the Western Reserve. And it was a it was a for a long period of that first century of American history, it was a pretty it was a rough place, the Western Reserve. It was. Some have described it as the last corner of the state of Ohio to be meaningfully settled by white men, given how rugged it was. Uh, by virtue of its geography, it was nestled right up against the coast of uh, Lake Erie. Uh, the weather that it suffered, the, the, the density of its forests, the, the wildlife that still lived in the area, it made it very hostile to settlers. But, uh, you know, the, the um, America's history is nothing if not a story of um you know yeah, people making it, it let sparsely settled parts of the continent more habitable to a wider group of people and so over time you you saw that wilderness start to ebb uh, it was primarily new england settlers started ending up in that corner of ohio for a while but what really transformed it was the development of the Ohio Canal, which was this massive infrastructure project in the first half of the 19th century. And uh, the Ohio Canal was this industrial waterway that was created at great effort, basically bisecting the state of Ohio. And that finally, in the words of one settler, it brought, um, it brought civilization to the wilderness. Now, those are loaded terms, of course, in the way we're trying to think about American history from the perspective of different demographics. But that was really what started to transform the region. Uh, and Garfield was born there into a log, into a homesteader's cabin to a family of, um, uh, of fairly poor uh, New England Yankee descendants who had, again, moved fairly, relatively recently to the area. Uh, and so it was probably, I've said this on, I didn't say this in the book, but I did, I have said this since on the tour. Uh, it was probably one of the lowest rungs of American society that a white Northern male could be born to is to be born into a, you know, that, that corner of Ohio into a homesteading family, you know, in a cabin in that setting. Um, you know, the Garfields again, especially after the death of the father, Abram. It was hard sledding, to say the least. Every single member of the family had to work, including the children, which was not uncommon at the time uh, in the region. Uh, socially, the region was reflective of New England values, and that manifested in a couple of different ways. First, you had, uh, I'd argue, you had a real emphasis on education. There was this small town uh, Yankee colonial emphasis on the value of education in uh children's lives. And so in what was relatively rare for early American history, you had uh, in a form year round schooling available uh, in the region still. Uh, now, sometimes those schools cost a little bit of money and sometimes a lot of families in the Western Reserve uh, couldn't really afford to have their children not be working in the field. But it was something that all families still had a cultural importance that they placed on. But second, I'd argue the Western Reserve was uh, it was a it was a hotbed of abolitionism, interestingly enough. Uh, and that was also a product of part geography and part the uh, social identity of the people moving to it. You know, Yankees, New Englanders are inherently anti-slavery at this point in American history. And uh, by virtue of the geography of the Western Reserve being right on Lake Erie, which is essentially, you know, right on the uh, on the other side, you have Canada. Uh, it was a pipeline for escaped slaves from the South who were trying to get to Canada. They would very often flee through the Western Reserve. So it was described, at least by one writer, as being kind of the mecca of the 
person escaping bondage, which isn't entirely fair, to be honest, though, because not that many slaves stuck around. They, they kept on going to Canada. You know, you don't stop at Mecca. You, 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 you keep going in this context. Um, but also uh, it, it was uh, it was a place where anti-slavery feeling really germinated. It was described as being later on, it was described as being the uh, Gibraltar of abolitionism. And as a matter of fact, John Brown, you know, the very famous militant abolitionist, uh, he grew up in the Western Reserve. So this is well before the Harper's Ferry days. He was a product of that society in part. So um, it's an interesting little corner of his of, of the state of Ohio and also American history. It's, it's also been estimated, at least by one historian, that the uh, that the Western Reserve had a higher concentration of stops on the Underground Railroad as any other similarly uh, similarly sized part of America. So it's a pretty interesting place for somebody for Garfield to be from, which is this white blue collar, but you know, really burningly socially progressive part of America. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, he has a. He discovers at a young age that he has a, a both an aptitude and a passion for books and learning and mm. gets an opportunity, thanks to his mother, to go to school, at least for a short period of time. How did he stay at school and continue studying? What were some of the jobs that he, he did a number of different things while he was at school to continue to pay his way? And yeah, he through, did. Through the, uh, this opportunity at, at school, he really begins this, this uh, amazing rise uh, through the merit of hard work and, and good character as well. Yeah, it was good character. It was hard work. But it, it, was, uh, it was also, very importantly, it was the generosity of his family, at least at the very beginning. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're right that he displayed this unnatural aptitude for reading for learning at a young age in, in a household where that was, I'll just say, unusual. Uh, it was exceptional uh, relative to his siblings and his parents. Uh, and at a very early age, his mom, uh, Garfield, when Garfield was very young, his mom did, realized this, indulged it, as you described, and um, sustained it. She used the family savings. She would loan them to him to pay for his early schooling. But eventually, you're right, it was insufficient. Uh, although Garfield would always credit his, his, his family's generosity in allowing him to get that kickstart. But he worked a variety of jobs. He was a carpenter. He was a hired hand. He was a woodcutter. Very famously, he, was a, uh, he, he worked on the Ohio Canal for a summer. Now, this was when he was actually trying to run away from home and was considering not going to school anymore. But he went and he worked as a as a driver on the towpath of that Ohio Canal that I was describing. Earlier. And this ends up being very useful political imagery for him. It, it conjures up all these blue collar images of, you know, good old fashioned American uh, hard work and country life and all that stuff. But he, he worked a, a variety of jobs. And as he got older and as he got into as he really accessed better and better schooling, uh, he started uh, teaching. Teaching became something that he did part time. And, and uh, aside from that stint on the canal, something that really distinguished him was he, he showed up at a school called the Western Reserve Eclectic Institute, which was somewhere between, you know, a local school and a university. It wasn't giving out full on bachelor's degrees, but it was a local school that would soon become a college. Today, it's known as Hiram College. And it is a fully accredited institution and all that stuff. But when Garfield first showed up, he could not afford to go as a regular student himself. So what he did was, as a student, uh, he also worked as its janitor. So he would sweep the school. He would clean the classrooms. He would stoke the fires in winter. He would uh, ring the bell ahead of class to alert everybody that he was going to class or or that it, it was time to go to class. And uh, that also became a very important part of his imagery. Somebody who, while going to school, worked as the janitor at the lowest you know, position, really, on the campus. But then you go forward a couple of years, and he has graduated to being not just a student, like a full-time student, but also he is teaching 
some of the classes themselves. So, you know, talk about hard work and good character. And he really exemplified that from a young age. When he eventually got to the presidency, a lot of political hay was made out of this. You know, his life, when the biographies first started to come out, they all had uh, the same title. They all, they all had, they, they all went, they all went by a basic formula, I should say. And they, they all had some variation of, from log cabin to White House, or from the towpath to the White House, and they and, and so they're all talking about his his art because he seemed again like the embodiment of the American dream. But uh, uh, his and that's all a hundred percent, you know, well earned. He he is as, as you display you, or you, you you discussed. He you know he did work his way rightfully into that position. But when Garfield eventually did move into the White House, something I find even more impressive when he moved in, he took his mom with him. So, so really the Eliza Garfield story, the person that he would always credit with his rise to public power, you know, her story is also from the log cabin of the White House, which I find perhaps even more inspirational, his devotion to paying her back. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When did he first meet Lucretia? And uh, can you describe some of the difficulties that they had in developing their relationship and then their marriage in the first few yeah, years? Yeah, yeah. To, to, to summarize for your audience, Lucretia and James Garfield had, uh, at one point, I'd argue, could be considered one of the worst marriages in presidential history, and then eventually became one of the best. Uh, They met at a school called the Geauga uh, Seminary. I'm sorry. It was a local uh, district school in the region of Ohio. Lucretia Garfield was also a Western Reserve girl, uh, although her parents were more well off than the Garfields. Um, uh, Lucretia Rudolph being her given name. Her her father, Zeb Rudolph, Zebediah, was uh, an influential local man. And uh, from the very beginning, they had a perfect match in terms of their intellect. Something James Garfield picked up very early on was that Lucretia was somebody who had a, a mind, a mental capacity that, and a scholarship that, that really was very close, if not at least, a match of his own. And he found this very attractive. Uh, his earlier romantic I'll, I'll just say liaisons because that's the best way to describe the interactions of those times. He'd been unimpressed with the less serious women. So Lu- Lucretia was that she, she, the, their early letters, they are dueling on matters of classics on religion. You know, th- there's a deep well of intellect in, 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 in Lucretia's mind. But the problem from a young James Garfield's perspective was that Lucretia was not a very warm charismatic or affectionate person and actually as a matter of fact he one of his earliest diary entries about her he wrote about feeling yes very stimulated by her intellect but then he went on to say uh to quote him i doubt she has that warmth of feeling that i need to make myself happy so you can tell where his priorities are (laughs) you know Mm -hmm. he's a young go-getter who needs you know affirmation stimulation all that stuff and uh he when he eventually decided to marry her because it took him a few years it, which was scandalous at the time almost um he wrote in his he wrote in his diary uh, uh you know he didn't write i i married lucretia rudolph he wrote i was married to lucretia rudolph by this mm-hmm. reverend so he you know, it was a passive decision and that manifests in the first years of their marriage uh he is barely around his wife. He is barely around the child that they have together. And the low point for sure comes when he actually, in the middle of the civil war, he has an affair on, he cheats on her with a a New York journalist. And, uh, that in many ways, uh, I'd, I'd argue in another time that would have been perhaps the end of their relationship, but it ends up, you know, for, I think reasons of quality of connection, but also just the times it ends up being an inflection point in their relationship. Garfield atones. He swears to do right by his, his, his wife. And, uh, you fast forward 10 years, 15 years, and, uh, they have 
the, the Garfields are famously this happy family in Washington. And uh, people ask Garfield at numerous points what the secret to his happy marriage is. And he, would, he, he used this line a few different times. He said, I've been wonderfully blessed in the uh, disposition of my wife. She is unstampedable. And that mm. phrase, unstampedable, it implies reason to stampede. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, but the bond was really true. And their letters from that point are, uh, y- you know, given the tragedy of how this life ends, it's, uh, you, you can see that love shining through right to the very end in a variety mm-hmm. of ways. So in 1863, he becomes a member of the House of Representatives. I'm wondering if in the uh, decade or so of antebellum years leading up to the Civil War, we get the formation of the Republican Party. And uh, when he joins the House of Representatives, he will fit in with uh, a wing of the party known as the Radical Republicans. Mm. So can you... uh, give some detail about how, why the Republican Party forms uh, in the years leading up to the Civil War, and what did it mean to be a radical Republican in the years before the Civil War? Yes, so the Republican Party, uh, at least the Republican Party of that era, because there is one that came a a long time before, and now we're in one that's, I argue, very different in a variety of ways. But the Republican Party of, of, uh, was, of that era was formed uh, in the aftermath of the tearing apart of the old Whig Party. Uh, and, the, and what had torn apart the Whig Party was this divide between the northern and southern Whigs over really the future of slavery and, and the place of slavery in the Republic. And so uh, the Republican Party formed in the aftermath of that. And it was very importantly, and this is something I think people... Uh, sometimes struggle to understand. It was a coalition of different factions of American that were to various degrees anti-slavery. And, and, they, and, they, and they, they ran a span of different affiliations. You had free soilers who were uh, concerned for, you know, for example, you had free soilers who were concerned with simply limiting the expansion of slavery. They weren't necessarily interested in delving into the South and, uh, you know, abolishing the, the institution altogether, they simply saw the spread of it as, as bad, and, and they were relatively moderate on that issue. Uh, but, you know, late, late, you know, you go down that spectrum, and uh, soon enough, uh, on the other side of the Republican Party, you have the radical Republicans. And as that name implies, they were, uh, they were uncompromising in their devotion, not, not just to the end of slavery, but very often to the complete equality of race in America. Uh, the radical Republicans throughout the, you know, leading up to the Civil War, throughout the Civil War, and then decisively speaking after the Civil War, they were devoted not just to, you know, during the war to abolishing slavery immediately, something that Lincoln was, for, you know, reasons of executive leadership, slow to overtly warm up to. But the radicals were for the immediate equality of races before the law. And then in politics, they wanted to extend equal voting rights throughout the races immediately, almost from the outset of the Civil War and even before then. Uh, they, moreover, during the Civil War, they were, and then afterward, they were in favor of um, either disenfranchising, uh, exiling, or executing leading Confederates. And uh, many of them, including Thaddeus Stevens, their leader in the House, even argued for the uh, redistribution of Southern property, of breaking up the big plantations that had been the hotbed of slavery and redistributing those giant tracts of land to uh, former slaves and who the radicals called loyal whites. So, I mean, that's that 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 is uh, that. I'd be committing a huge historical error by making over comparisons to our times, but I'm just going to say that that's a pretty woke position for that period. <laughs> and mm-hmm. uh, they, and, and the radicals saw moderacy on these issues as being akin to treason. And very interestingly, the radicals blended uh, patriotism. They, they, they viewed their, 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 uh, their beliefs as being in line with the will of the founders and they viewed uh, the Civil War not as this interruption 
to you know the, uh, the or, or even a troubled continuation of the original republic. Uh, the, the the radicals viewed the Civil War as a second American revolution. They, they saw it as an opportunity to make America as it should have been at the very beginning. And so the, it's, it's central to all of that was instituting a quality of race formally within our structures. And, and uh, that is the faction of Republican that James Garfield sympathized with before the war, overtly joined during the war, and then came to define for a good few years after the war. He uh, participated in the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, which were those big radical goals of equality, at least in theory, before the, before the law and politics between the races. And um, at certain points in his early career, he identified, he said, I, you know, he, he would very proudly boast of his radical credentials. He would say, I've, you know, I've never been anything but radical on all of these matters of the war and all of these matters of race. And and that's uh, that. That's the James Garfield we see early on, and and he is somebody who is described by Democrats. Democrats again being a very different party back then. They, they, you can't really do apples to apples, but they, let's just say that they were they were a different party back then than they are today. Uh, they uh, described him as as wild a radical as ever walked the halls of the Capitol. That was the James Garfield of that time. He was this young, this hotshot general who had uh, been too, almost too disruptive on the war front. He was causing trouble by, he, he was discontent. He was complaining about his superiors because they weren't prosecuting the war effectively. So he runs off to Congress and he causes trouble there. And uh, he's a real iconoclast. Uh, and mm. it's, it's really interesting to read about for somebody again, who I hadn't really known. It was just, it, it was somebody who uh, was uncompromising in their ideals for what, America should be. And there was somebody who has a, a, a view of these issues that I'd argue is well ahead of their times and, and who mm -hmm. views obstacles to that vision of America. This, again, this righteous, equal plane of American existence uh, as being something that should sweep away obstacles of law and constitutionality. So he's really out there. And um, the peak of that comes actually, I'd argue, July 4th, 1865. This is his Independence Day speech uh, after the end of the war. And the speech that James Garfield gives, he's not, he's not congratulating the Union for winning the war. He is giving this fiery speech about the victory that has yet to be won for the call for, for over the motivations of the war. And that is the quality of citizenship, equality of, uh, of, uh, you know, political rights for all races of Americans. And then at the, at the, at the, at the peak of this speech, he passes out, he faints in the middle of the speech. And that's the transition point. You, I see you nodding, so you probably know that. That's 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 the moment that I decide to use for his transition to the post-war Garfield, the uh, the reconstruction process, the winning of the peace, which, as you know, is a troubled one. Uh, but that, mm -hmm. that's that's Garfield the radical right there. And during his service in the the Civil War, he was a, a leader of. I'm not sure what to call his unit. Was it a troop, a battalion uh, that he was in charge of? At first, it was a regiment. A regiment. And it was a, it was, and it was a volunteer regiment uh, in the Civil War and actually for a great span of early American history. Uh, during wartime, during existential wartime, uh, people like you or I could volunteer to become soldiers or if we organized enough of our friends and neighbors, officers of you know, volunteers, non-professional soldiers. Uh, and Garfield, being a man of influence before the war, was able to translate his leadership, his prominence in Ohio to commanding this volunteer regiment. Now, as he distinguished himself in the field, he inherited larger and larger commands. So he, be, you know, he, he went through brigades, he went through different armies, he, he served various generals. He, he, he really made a man of himself throughout the conflict. Mm-hmm. Did he was certainly in harm's way in in Kentucky and Chickamauga? Was he exchanging gunfire with with the rebels? And did he actually kill people, or was he yeah. one step removed from that? But uh, he was, of course, still in in harm's way, leading his his uh, regiment. But. Yeah, that's an interesting question. And I should say, my earlier yeah was not me saying yes, he did. Uh, he, uh -huh. he, he was not, I believe, directly involved in, he, he was not 
pulling pistols and blasting cannons himself. But he was involved mm-hmm. in he was involved in, as you described, very he was he was leading men. He was um, in the many battles that he was present for. He went through a variety of command roles. So in that early Sandy Valley campaign, Garfield was the one who was leading for various regiments into the field, uh, arranging his men on the scenes of battle, chasing uh, rebel troops as they went through these hills. And then as he uh, went through Shiloh and then uh, later on Chickamauga, he was really in the thick of some pretty bloody scenes. And uh, it, it is, and he just, he demonstrated real valor, real courage. Um, it came under gunfire many, many times, came very close uh, to being wounded himself. There's a scene at, Ch- at Shiloh, actually, where he arrives on the scene of the battle because he was a little bit of a late arrival. And mm-hmm. a shell goes over his shoulder and, and kills a man behind him. Uh, not only that, when he joined William Rosecrans's Army of the Cumberland, the person Garfield was replacing as chief of staff to General Rosecrans, Garfield's predecessor had been decapitated by a cannonball <laughs> right, right, right next to General Rosecrans because Rosecrans had gone too close to the front lines because that's, that's the type of commander Rosecrans was. So, mm-hmm. uh, no, he saw... He saw the heck of it, and he was responsible in decision making that led to you know the saving and then the losing of thousands of lives. He 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 knew that cost firsthand, and very painfully for him, actually, he had to bury uh, men that he had convinced to join, which uh, is a was this pain. at Shiloh? This was at uh, this was actually at the Battle of Middle, right after the Battle of Middle Creek, so part of that so- Kentucky campaign. So it was okay. when it was when a lot of the regiment had gotten sick. Uh, Garfield was burying people who had been his constituents, who, and, and he describes also burying a boy and remembering this conversation he had had with the boy's father, promising the father that the son would come home, and he didn't. Uh, yeah. So that's a uh, you know th- that is a uh, I, I don't want to go too deep down this rabbit hole. But Garfield, as you as you know from having read the book, there are a lot of moments where he was very slippery in terms of his decision making. He was very loose with some of his consistency ideologically, politically. But you know, it takes real valor to do what he did on the battlefield, and 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 what he saw, you know, it 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 it, uh, it certainly took a toll emotionally, morally. It's not something that I'd say very few of us these days could go through what he did and come out on the other side as he did mm-hmm. in as good a shape. When he was in Alabama, he saw slavery firsthand and became ever more convinced that their cause was just, that this had to be abolished. And I found it interesting that he, he also s- seemed to recognize that the South was eventually going to succumb to the Union and the war. And the greater challenge, as he saw it, was to get back into politics and uh, be a part of what we now identify as Reconstruction, the what would become yeah. the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, which took uh, fif- about 15 years to pass these three amendments. Uh, the fifteenth, the the, the the amendments themselves are actually pretty front loaded. They all they all happened in in the several years after the Civil War, but over the fifteen years of Reconstruction, what you actually saw was those amendments start. Well, at least the fourteenth and fifteenth, thirteenth, uh, you know, that slavery that that didn't come back in you know really, but uh, the fourteenth and fifteenth, which were for uh, civil and then overt political equality. Over the course of Reconstruction, those started to weaken dramatically and even be reversed in a great part of the South. Uh, But you're right. When Garfield was in the South, when he was in Alabama, it radicalized him even further because he was seeing slavery firsthand. And he was also he he was prophetic. He, he, He witnessed and I can't quite remember the quotes off the top of my head right now, but he witnessed um, the uh, he how difficult it's, it was going to be and how important it was going to be for the Union to win Reconstruction, to, to effectively win the peace. And his writing on that is just packed with foresight. And so that was part of his determination to leave the army 
and to go into politics because he wanted to be part of solving those problems. He was a very practical person who wanted to be a productive public figure. And the best route he saw for that was through Congress. So yes, he got out of the army and he was able to be of service uh, in Congress for that period. Uh, it'll do a, somewhat of an injustice to to skip over these amendments with uh, the 14th, for example, still being so relevant to today's America. But let's let's move ahead. Uh, he spends 17 years as a a member of Congress, mostly as a House of in in the House of Representatives, and throughout this time. Uh, develops a excellent reputation and this leads to interesting events that occur in Chicago in 1880 at the Republican National Convention he goes to the convention as a supporter of John I might get these names wrong. John Sherman, uh, the Sherman Blaine and Ulysses S. Grant is mm -hmm. is back in the the running again as well. He goes there on behalf of Sherman and comes away the nominee, Republican nominee. So, uh, if you can briefly, how does he continue to develop his reputation so much during this time that? that this kind of thing could happen to him in 1880. Mm. Yeah, he, Garfield, you know, the Garfield 17 years after he joins Congress is a very different one from the guy at the very beginning of that length of time. He has distinguished himself over that period by increasingly becoming this technocratic, pragmatic, very, very friendly open-minded, conciliatory figure in a Republican party that's getting more and more divided between the factions. Garfield is famously, and some would tell you infamously, he becomes this agreeable, friendly kind, almost uh, in the views of some just naively innocent member of an increasingly guilty age. Uh, and so by, by 1880, the Republican party is split between these factions. You have that have their own candidates for president trying to win the Republican nomination for the general election for the presidency. And uh, you have the Stalwarts who are trying to back Ulysses Grant. You have the half-breeds who are trying to back James Blaine. And then you have these independent reformist Republicans like John Sherman, who are just trying to be kind of clean government advocates, who are trying to purge the American federal government of these corrupt machines that are enabling James Blaine, and then on the other hand, a lot of the Stowards to keep in power, to monetize their offices. So it's a awful situation politically because the Republicans are so divided. It looks like if any of these candidates win, these overt candidates, then the party is going to lose in the general election because it'll be so divided. And so many, many independent uh, uh, analysts, uh, critics start thinking that a dark horse is necessary, somebody who can be on the convention floor and save the Republican Party from its divisions. And a lot of them land on James Garfield as an alternative. He is the minority leader of the House by this point. And he is somebody who seems like one of the rare Republicans who's capable of stitching all of these factions, factions together. So he uh, is told about this possibility, his potential candidacy ahead of time. And he denies it to the people who are coming to him with this idea. He says he's not interested, but he leaves some conditions open minded. And, and, you know, in part, that's because of genuine hesitation he has. He is genuinely afraid of the presidency and he doesn't want to, you know, pursue it. But part of him is intrigued. So he leaves the door open. He shows up at the convention in Chicago as the floor manager for one of these reformist candidates, John Sherman, and events just so happened to go in just such a way through his machinations, through the machinations of allies, and then just through the turning of events where he becomes surprisingly, almost in ambush, made the Republican candidate for that election. So it was uh, uh, something that he didn't see coming, but it, in many ways it sealed his fate. Mm -hmm. He 
conducts a, what's called a, a front porch campaign where reporters and visitors came to his place that he built in Ohio and he'd uh, talk with them there. He wins the presidency by a, a good electoral margin, but the popular vote was rather close. But you you mention in the book that after the election that uh, Rutherford B. Hayes won, there was a lot of questions about the legitimacy of the election. There weren't questions about the legitimacy uh, of this one. The nation sort of sighed a, a relief almost that this was a, a, a sound election. Mm. They were, and, yes. It, it's yeah. um, 1876 is worth uh, hours and hours of interview time, given how deep <laughs> and complicated and relevant and it is as an issue. Uh, so I'll just consign that to saying uh, it was the, the election of 1876 was, I, I'd argue, the first election in American history where the losing side claimed fraud and threatened civil war. And there was a constitutional crisis over who would ascend to the White House the following year. Garfield's was the election after that. And uh, democracies are nothing if not self-correcting. And the status quo is never in vogue. And in the aftermath of 1876, uh, then you have the election of 1880. In the election of 1880, uh, Americans were just relieved that uh, things went smoother than they had the last time. And they were intolerant of any party that would try to disrupt the peace by that point. There was some chicanery in the election of 1880, and uh, Garfield's allies tacitly admitted as, as much. But it was relatively above the board. The opposition, the Democratic Party, was pulling some tricks, too. And uh, things just seem to skate on by. But very importantly, uh, Garfield's electoral college victory was decisive. He, he won the two crucial swing states of that election, New York and Indiana. And as a result, you had this narrow popular win, but a pretty decisive electoral college win. So everybody was happy to just dust their hands and, you know, move on <laughs> to, <laughs> to, be, to better times. Uh, I thought you made a interesting choice as a biographer to not give any more notoriety to the assassin, the the man who uh, ran up behind Garfield when he was in a train station and shot him twice in the back. And this ended up being uh, a mortal wound because of the infection that subsequently occurred. Uh, when you make reference to where this person is from time to time he's sort of the shadowy figure and mm. i i think most people if they can remember that james garfield was one of the presidents who was assassinated probably was, have a hard yes. time recalling recalling uh, who uh, assassinated him whereas john wilkes booth with lincoln or lee harvey oswald with kennedy these names are notorious and remembered mm. in history so, yeah, uh, I thought. Uh, yeah, well, I'm glad you noticed that because he, he, so Garfield was shot twice. He was shot. He was winged in the arm. So the first shot was kind of a glancing blow. The second hit him square in the lower back. And uh, the uh, the decision to not by myself to not overtly identify the assassin by name. I described him as a person, but I didn't want to give him a name mm -hmm. and to not be fixated on him was a deliberate one that, you know, I don't know how it came off in the writing. People have noticed it, which I appreciate. But um, his mindset was one of an incredibly disturbed individual who's motivated in part politically, but also in part just due to the straight up old fashioned mental illness. Um, he wanted fame. When, when, when the assassin shot Garfield, he was in pursuit of fame right there. He even picked his choice of weapon based off of how good it would look in a museum display, which shows you what this person was shooting for, so to speak. And uh, the reaction of the American public 
was to give him that attention, to give him that fame. Uh, you know, writers would describe, ah, like, you know, this, this individual, um, he, no one is interested in his career. No one's interested in him. But in fact, you had these John, journalists would visit him in jail. Uh, his, these, these diluted campaign speeches he had given in the last election were reprinted for huge audiences. You know, the, the public reacted by giving this person the infamy that they were seeking in killing the president. And mm-hmm. as a modern writer, I, I just wanted to kind of tack in a different direction. It reminded me, to be honest, a lot of mass shooter mentalities. And um, mm. I, what I really wanted to do, uh, I'm lifting the curtain a little bit, I actually didn't want to identify him overtly at all. I, I didn't even want to name this person at all in the book. Unfortunately, uh, so, you know, a publisher weighed in and said, you got to name him at least once. Mm-hmm. So I named him at least once. I, I, it was once at the very end. But then I go on to say, but perhaps it would have been better if we'd all just forgotten his name in the first place. Yeah, so that's what I tried to do. Listeners can buy the book and and uh, find find where you named him that one time. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those. It's, yeah, it's it's it's, uh, it's one of those moments uh, where we'll see if the intent comes across. Uh, so mm-hmm. uh, we'll I, see. I thought it did. I thought it as a. a choice as a writer it it came off well to to my eye read in the book so, oh great i appreciate that yeah so uh i'll ask my final question now and it's it's about the the subtitle of the book and how that describes garfield's life you say that he moves from a radical to a unifier mm-hmm. and throughout the book this is a theme that you seem to emphasize about garfield that even going back to his teenage days, participating in debate clubs, he tries to see different sides of issues and keep people from feeling hostile towards one another, keep things together. Uh, I can't help but feel that in emphasizing uh, the unifier that you're also, uh, you're, you're, emphasizing this theme about Garfield for the times in which we live, that uh, the United States and uh, the wider Western world seems to be straining under polarization. And examples of unification, uh, quite frankly, are are welcome. And so uh, what was this your motivation for emphasizing that that theme with Uh Garfield? Yeah, I think his, I think historians and biographers, whether popular or academic, they are always in some way, shape or form, either directly or indirectly writing through the lens of their own times. Uh, so that was something that did jump out to me throughout. I mean, you have in Garfield's life, you have uh, profound divisions over uh, matters of wealth in America. You have political polarization. You have uh, social stratification between the races. Um, You even have a constitutional crisis over disputed presidential election, which when I started writing this book, I did not know that was going to happen in real life today. And then that ended up happening. And, you know, I wish it hadn't is all I'll say. But uh, so the lesson that I took from his life uh, in in part was um, a lot of the things that we say that, that we today, contemporarily, uh, say, are unprecedented, are often less unprecedented than we like to think they are. These, you know, the themes that our societies are dealing with, to a certain extent, they're timeless, and they've always been. And that both explains how we are where we are, but it also contextualizes them. And I'm not sure if it's reassuring or not, but there is something to be said for the fact that a lot of these things have in some way, shape or form happened before and we have gone on. Uh, mm-hmm. And um, the, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a complicated narrative. That's a complicated political narrative, historical narrative, ethical, ideological narrative. So I don't know quite what to say about that. And in my writing style, um, I, I don't know if you noticed, I try to avoid analysis. I try rather I, I try to describe things as they are happening and let the reader mm-hmm. draw their own conclusions. 
I, I don't kick in and interrupt the narrative and say, here's what's, you know, here's what I think. Uh, I, I do have my own conclusions. And this is a subject that, you know, I'd argue I know like the back of my hand, the life of James Garfield. Uh, but there, there is a lot of room for interpretation. And I see that in the reviews of different, you know, a lot of reviews of this have now popped up both on, you know, from regular consumer as well as, as from editorialists. And some of the, it's been really interesting seeing the diversity of opinion. Some people have said Garfield was a scoundrel. They, you know, they, they, they talk to me as him being somebody who can't be relied upon and who blows with the wind. And that was something people said of him during his day. I have others. And I honestly say this is a pretty, this is a majority of reviewers. They, they really, you know, their vision of the man is uniformly positive. Um, the worst thing you can ask a biographer, by the way, is whether they like their subject. Because if you, you know, it's not as easy as like or dislike. You're, you're analyzing mm -hmm. life. You're analyzing the greatest story that can be told, I'd argue, which is a human life. And um, he, uh, you know, it, there, there are chapters of this history that are dark. And there are chapters that are, in, that are you know, insp awe-inspiring. And, and the composite person is complicated, accomplished, uh, compelling, compassionate, cold callous, intellectual, uh, thin skinned, you know, perfectly human. And, and, and so, uh, there's a lot to be said for somebody like that. And it, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's terrible how the life ended, of course, uh, because mm -hmm. it, it ends with a death. It ends with a, a, a gruesome death. I should say all, all lives end with death, but it's, it, it's ended too short. And, you know, you're left almost from a story, storytelling perspective, what could have been, and I don't really know. But I, I did try to tell what was there as as best as I could. Hmm. Well, I really enjoyed the book, and I really enjoyed the opportunity to to learn about this man. I, I, someone who comes down on the side that I, I think he lived an admirable life, and I, I found him a very compelling person. So, if if people want to follow what you're what you're doing what's what's coming out next where can they oh, go yeah. to get that's, the book that's... or keep up to date with what you're doing uh they can go get the book at any major retailer i believe and uh amazon it's it's a, it's hardcover kindle and audiobook it's on audible uh mm -hmm. and in terms of uh what i'm doing uh so i have another book that's in the works but i don't really i have a website and i have a an instagram handle and um, I, I update the I update those uh, you know every, frequently, so uh, anybody can find me there. Great, well, I appreciate your time today. It was great talking to you. Thank you. Oh, thanks so much, Tyrell. I really appreciate it. Thanks. All right. Bye bye. See you.